All right, so welcome to the final video lecture uh, for this week, uh, which we're going to cover the last objective, which is essentially to differentiate between theory-based research and theory that is based on research. And so we covered in the last video the three major elements of a theory, which are what? The major factors and constructs, the relationships between those constructs, and the conditions under which those relationships occur or do not occur. And so we know that we can, when we're doing that kind of research, many times we are testing theories. And so when we are testing theories and starting with a theory and then testing hypotheses by collecting data at, through observation and confirming those hypotheses or theories, what kind of line of thinking are we doing? Deductive. We're going down. And we tend to take what kind of approaches in deductive thinking and model of inquiry? Quantitative approaches. Whereas when we start with data, when we start with our research, when we start with observation, we look at that observation and look for patterns, look for trends, look for themes that are emerging. And thus we try to make sense of that research and try to create these tentative hypotheses, generate these tentative hypotheses, and thus trying to make sense of these hypotheses and creating theories trying to explain these phenomenons and experiences. And so we generate hypotheses, generate theories in what kind of thinking and model of inquiry? In inductive thinking and model of inquiry. And many times we're using what type of approaches? Quantitative or qualitative? Qualitative methods. And so we see that when we look at how theory and observation, when we think about observation, we're talking about data collection, collecting data and analyzing that data. So when we think about when we are starting with the theory and testing that theory through observation, we are doing deductive thinking. But when we start with observation, when we start with the research, start with the data and generate hypotheses, we are doing inductive research, inductive thinking. And so we have in deductive line of thinking, theory-based research. Because the research we are conducting is based on a theory that we found, the constructs within that theory. And since we operationalize those constructs, we're testing those variables, testing hypotheses. So we have theory based on research. But then on the other side, when we do the inductive line of thinking, when we're doing qualitative methodology and approaches, the theories that we are generating, the theories that we are creating, is based on the research we collect, based on the observations and data that we analyze. For example, grounded theory. And we'll take a look at an example of grounded theory at the very end of this. So, what kind of studies should be theory-based studies? Right? Deductive line of thinking. Deductive studies. Intervention studies. Determine when we see some causal relationship, we're trying to intervene and say, okay, if we see that, or lack of knowledge rather, leads to poor eating behaviors, then we can intervene with education. And thus, we plan an intervention. We implement that intervention, and we then we evaluate to see how well that intervention worked or not. In intervention studies, we should have, those types of research studies should be based on a theory. When we're doing studies that examine relationships among things, like how variables might be associated with, with each other, like the research that you guys are going to be doing this semester, you're going to be looking at how your IV and DV are related to each other. You're testing hypotheses, testing some theory that helps make sense of how you think the IV and DV are related. And different types of studies that ask how things happen or why things happen. These are types of studies that should be based on a theory, hence theory-based research, theory-based studies. But what types of studies probably don't need to be theory-based? Types of studies that are surveillance studies or tracking studies. For example, how many new cases of disease X were there this year? And how many will there be in the coming years? What type of federal agency are you familiar with 
that does a lot of this type of surveillance tracking. Incidence studies. Think of Walking Dead. The CDC, right? The CDC doesn't have to base their research, base their studies on a theory. They're simply trying to figure out how many new cases of syphilis, chlamydia, and gonorrhea are there. And they're doing a damn good job of collecting that because we know that those numbers are going up and up and up. And then prevalence studies. Prevalence studies, which are also a count of things that are currently going on, but when we're not testing hypotheses, without examining relationships between variables, you don't see these types of studies too often. But it's pretty much when it comes to prevalence and incident studies, when we're tracking and surveilling different types of conditions and disease and illness. Probably don't need to have a theory to guide that research. But what kind of theories should be based on research then? Ideally, all theories should be based on some systematic, rigorous research studies that are replicated several times. We should be testing these theories over and over and over again. We know from a little kid that theory is not law. These theories can always be refuted, can always be revised, should always be tested for its validation because things are changing, the world changes. So let's think about an example, smoking. Let's go back to our previous example. Thinking about what you might know. Right, so you're looking at an example of applying theory-based intervention research. Who do you think will benefit most from a smoking prevention program? People who are chain smokers or people who have not yet started smoking? Right? Based on your a priori knowledge, what you previously know, what you already know, who do you think might benefit most? Well, do you think chain smokers would? People smoking over and over and over again, do you think that they're actually going to benefit from a smoking prevention program? It makes sense that people who have not started smoking yet, because we're talking about a smoking prevention program versus a smoking sensation program. Right? Smoking prevention program, it makes sense that people who have yet to smoke are going to benefit most compared to people who are already smoking. But if we change this question to who will benefit most from a smoking cessation program, well, smoke chain smokers would, not those who have started smoking yet. Because based on what we know, based on theory, based on how we understand the behaviors of smoking. But here's another one, a tougher question you may or may not know. And it has, you have to have a little bit of prior knowledge to be able to answer this question. When is the best time to administer a smoking prevention program? Because we know people who have not started smoking yet is the best time. Well, when do you think that might be? At age 8? At age 12? At age 20? When do you think is the best time? Based on what you know from the previous question and just based on theory. Based on what we know in terms of explaining people's smoking behaviors. What's an easy one we can easily cross off our list in terms of options? People who are 20 years old, right? They're already old enough to already buy cigarettes. So it probably isn't best to try to administer a smoking prevention program then. It might make sense to do it earlier, right? Because we know people who have not started smoking yet might benefit the most from them compared to chain smokers. People who are 20 years old might already be chain smoking. So the piece of information that you might need to know or that might be helpful in helping you answer this question is that the average age of smokers in the U.S. Do you happen to know that answer? What the average age of the U.S. smoker is? It's about 15 years old. And so, where do you think people would most benefit from when it comes to trying to administer a smoking prevention program? People age 8 or age 12? Look at this 8-year-old boy compared to the 12-year-old boy in the middle. What makes more sense? Eight, maybe? Some of you might be thinking. They're young enough. You might want to even before get to them before they even have a chance, maybe in middle school. But they also might be too young at age eight. So maybe people who are age 12. People who are 12 years old, high school, or middle school rather, might be starting to talk to some people. At this point, maybe starting to know people who might have access to it. So maybe this time might be a better time to, to administer a smoking prevention program. Right, so it could be a toss-up between age 8 and age 12. My educated guess would be people at age 12 would probably be the best time to administer a smoking prevention program. 
So again, we're looking at how we can use theory when we do intervention research, right? Theory-based research. But let's take an example of theory that is based on research. This is what we call grounded theory. This is a hypothetical grounded theory, trying to explain how smoking behavior and smoking outcomes occur at different stages of a person's life. <clears throat> and so we see at youth, this part on this left side, we have at youth started smoking. As we can see in the key here, we have in the ovals, the rounded edges, we have the influence, the arrow, and then we have in nice clean rectangle or corners, we have the effect. So we see the effect is, and the outcome would be, youth starts smoking at a young age. And then we see that this is moving through a, life, a, times, a person's lifetime. And so we see peer pressure. We know it can be an influence in somebody starting to smoke at a young age. We also know that cultural influences like tobacco can also be whether or not somebody smokes. But also these things too, as we can see here through the, through the arrows, also are influencing each other. But we also see that cultural influences, cultural traditions, like smoking being a taboo issue or something we shouldn't do, it can also lead to being fearful of shame, of being punished, because we know that at a young age, we can get in trouble for smoking. But we can also, if you tell people, we can also be shamed for that. And thus, people will either not smoke as the outcome, or people will hide it. They'll choose to do behavior, but they will hide it. So we see we're trying to explain somebody's smoking behaviors at a young age based on some of the interviews, maybe some research that we've conducted to make sense of what are some of the things that influence somebody smoking or not smoking at a young age. And we can then look at older, uh, early adulthood, look at 20 to 30 year olds, those who continue to smoke. What are some of the things that lead to them continuing to smoke? Well, maybe you work, your work environment, maybe you're allowed to smoke, maybe you're not allowed to smoke. Maybe now at this age, you're starting to experience more stress, and thus we know that smoking is what people can use sometimes to alleviate stress, albeit not a very, in a very effective way or healthy way of using it. So we know that there's an influence of the environment and how whether or not can someone continues to smoke into early adulthood, but we also know that this can also influence addiction and habit, which we can lead to in later on in life. But other things that influence early adulthood smoking we see is Again, cultural tradition. Smoking is an unclean thing. We know that this is something that our society is starting to accept and starting to advertise and talk about. And so if you know that smoking is unclean, maybe at a young adulthood, you're not really living at home anymore, so you tend to smoke while you're away. Or you choose to not smoke. But as we go into older adulthood, mature adulthood, we see people who are still smoking, who might be continuing to smoke. They will always be lifelong smokers. They are indifferent to social pressures and health risk, and they just continue to smoke. They know their perceived susceptibility, the severity, but for whatever reason, they continue to smoke, and thus continue to smoke until they die. Not maybe because of smoking, but just because of just whatever reasons. But people who don't smoke. We know that addiction and habit can lead to that. We know that influence of campaigns, awareness campaigns, responsibilities, family responsibilities, work responsibilities, all of these things can lead to fear of shame from what we're learning and hearing from campaigns, from the media, but also getting sick. And what happens to then being able to provide for your family, provide for your spouse, significant other. And thus people will choose not to smoke as they get older because they start to see some of the risks related to not smoking or to smoking and that's the benefits to not smoking and so we see how this is a theory trying to explain people's behaviors and smoking behaviors as they progress through life that is based on research thus we have previously theory based research and as we see here in front of us theory that is based on research all right, that's it. So just a few other things to talk about before the end of this video and this week's lecture. Some health-related theories that you might want to refer to to see if it might apply to your IV and DV are obviously your notes from 440, your theory class. 
There's also a book that you can find online and in the library, Theories in Health Promotion. But as I mentioned last week and this week, do not limit yourself to these theories that you found, that you've learned about, right? Don't limit yourself to the health promotion theories, but because rather, most of these theories are intervention, intervention related theories, change theories. You're not doing an intervention, so they may not necessarily fit your study, fit your hypothesis. So what you should do is expand to other fields and other disciplines. Look at psychology, look at psychiatry, look at sociology, look at anthropology, political science, biology, urban planning, cultural studies, gender studies, right? Look at counseling. As I advised, when you do a search for theories, put in your IV, your DV, and put in the theory and see what's out there. This might be a good way to help you narrow that down and find some articles. Okay, so next week, as you know, on Tuesday, homework one is due. We'll talk about research ethics, and then I'll introduce homework two, which is then due two weeks after. Otherwise, have a great weekend. Good luck working, looking for articles. Shoot me an email. Don't forget to take advantage of your graduate assistants, Priyanka and Adriana, if you need further assistance. Take care.